interaction on Discord. And today we have an even more exciting day with a really amazing keynote. So I'm gonna pass the floor on to Tom to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to day three of ESEC FSE, also from me. We have a very special treat for you today. It's the keynote on the Atari Women by Panil Bjorn. Panil is a full professor and head of department of research at the University of Copenhagen. She works in computer-supported collaborative work and human-computer interaction. And some of her research is on global software development, on healthcare information systems, and also on tech entrepreneurship. Pernille is also passionate about um, attracting women to computer science. In 2016, she initiated a research initiative aimed at changing gender diversity in computing by using maker technologies. In 2019, she spent a year at University of Washington in Seattle as a visiting professor. And at that time, she co-founded the Atari Women Project, which is celebrating the women who made important contributions to Atari in the 70s and the 80s. Atari Women was very popular and it was actually part of Emerald City Comic Con, which is one of the largest comic conventions in the United States. And it was also exhibited at the Living Computer Museum in 2019. And today I'm very excited that Panil will tell us more about the Atari Women and their contributions to computing. So, please go Thank ahead. you very much. So, I'm just going to share my slides. It works? Yep. Great. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be asked to, uh, to come and talk to you about Atari Women. Of course, I would much rather be there in present and actually <laughs> physically talk to you all, but I hope we can have discussion back uh, afterwards as well. Uh, so, uh, so this work is work uh, that I both have done up at University of Copenhagen, but also work I have done at University of Washington, uh, and it's been sponsored by a Fulbright scholarship. But first I thought, uh, so now I'm going to talk a lot about uh, you know, women and gender in computer science, but I think it's also important to say that, like what Tom also just said, I actually do other things. So this is kind of another project of mine. So I just want to say, like, like who am I normally and, and why did I get here? So uh, um, my main area of research is computer supported cooperative work, CSW and human computer interaction done a lot of work in healthcare, looking at infrastructures for healthcare, looking at how do we make nurses support by cooperative technologies. Done a lot of work in global software development, particularly looking at uh, how it is to work from India uh, in um, uh, distributed collaborative uh, software development situations. And finally, also on tech entrepreneurship, where I spent quite some time uh, in, in, in Palestine uh, together uh, with uh, colleagues, where we studied the Palestinian tech entrepreneurs. So how did I get to, as a computer science professor, <laughs> work in the computer science department to suddenly uh, work on, on, the, on, the, on gender? So I think the first thing that is important to say that in 2015, I uh, was uh, hired as a, a full professor at the computer science department at University of Copenhagen, which I was co of course very proud of and very happy to do. And while I knew that there was very few women there, I was surprised to learn that I was actually the first uh, woman full, full professor hired in that department since the department was established in uh, 1970. So it's like 50 years ago today. Uh, so uh, I was surprised about that. And also I looked at the numbers of uh, women students we had in our programs. And as you can see here, it's, it, when it go, went really high in 2000, it was 9%, but you know, it was basically between seven and eight the most of the time. So I thought, okay, um, uh, if I'm going to now be uh, in the computer science department until I retire, and there will hopefully be some years to go because it's not a quick fix, uh, what can I maybe contribute beside doing my research to maybe also change some of these gender statistics? So that's kind of how I started to get interested in it and saying I want to do something there. Also, uh, this is not just something from University of Copenhagen and our programs. As you also know, all these um, 
uh, headings are headlines are all from this year. So it's not something, even though I started in 2015, we still have not actually solved the problem. These are all these different headlines of, uh, on what can be done, not just in the universities, but also in tech business. So I thought, uh, what is this strange phenomena? How come <laughs> we have so few women here? And what can we do about it? So basically, because I'm a researcher, I wanted to start a research project. So in 2016, uh, I created uh, femtech.dk, which is um, a, a research initiative that is focusing on one thing, uh, on kind of having these kind of a uh, principle behind it. So first, we don't just look at numbers and we're not just surprised uh, or happy if we, if we get good numbers. We are looking at the unbalanced gender statistic as symptoms of something else and that we need to fix the symptoms rather than just kind of focus on numbers. So that means basically we want to understand what are the fundamental issues that is the problem here and we want to unpack what is the nature of equity in computer science, what does that really mean? And to do this as, uh, as research, um, uh, the project is thought of as an action research initiative. And why I'm saying initiative is that a project is normally like three, five years, but if we're gonna change this, it takes some more years. So it's set up across several projects, but uh, over a long time. That's why I call it an initiative. And basically as an action research project, uh, trying to change um, the gender statistics, uh, there is three main things that we are doing over all these many things. So one is that we are diagnostic the problem situation in many different ways, trying to understand what are the problems. And then we are trying to make interventions <laughs> and not just <laughs> late uh, in the process, but we actually do. Uh, I think I'm muted. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so the important thing is that we don't just wanna make understand everything and then do intervention. No, we actually do the intervention as we go and collect data about those interventions to take even more actions. So in this way, we're not kind of waiting for a long time. We actually trying to do it as we go while we are learning about this. So it's important to say that I am not a agenda researcher. This was very new to me when I started in 2015. So they had a lot to learn in that process. So some of the things we did, and we did a lot of things, is that uh, we tried to do, uh, think about new design of spaces for students, new teaching approaches. We did um, a particular um, uh, initiative to talk to uh, the, the teachers in the program. The we did workshop for the computer science professors uh, and did a lot of outreach. And one of the, the core things kind of as a structure for all this is that we try to I tell stories about what is computer science in different ways that you would normally see. And we did that by actually not just talking about it, but trying to demonstrate it. So here you see two pictures. So what on the, uh, the, the teddy bear you see on the left side is called CyberBear. And CyberBear is basically an IoT device that help high school students to hack their own high school schedule and see today if today's uh, schedule is the first uh, class cancel. And if yes, it lights up green, you can actually sleep longer in the morning or red if you kind of have to stay in bed. So the idea here is, is actually that we invited high school students to come and, um, and learn how to program IoT devices. That's what they did. Uh, but they also learned about e-textiles and also this idea that they actually made something that they could take home and use and, and kind of, and it's kind of a fun gimmick as well. So, so that was one thing we, we did. We learned from that intervention. This was kind of an intervention we did. We learned that uh, the, the women, uh, high school students we invited, which was particular students who were not interested in computer science. That was our game. We went out to actually find teachers who helped us to point to people we could invite to the university who had no interest from different schools. And we learned that there were this sewing thing. When you do e-textiles, it kind of require you to sew because that's kind of how you make the materials sit together. But this sewing was so, um, uh, our participants, they experienced that the sewing was too, we made them too gendered that now, so, so they did not really want to do that. They would rather kind of make sure that it shouldn't kind of have this kind of gender that just because they're women, they have to sew. So this, so from that learning, we, okay, we take that into account. So next time you see on the right side, we did cryptosphere, 
which is basically made of styrofoam, not any sub sewing involved, still is IoT. Uh, what this does is that it encrypt messages on Facebook and then it decrypt them through motion centers and colors. So again, we show interacting with technology is not about keyboards and, um, uh, and touch screens, but it can be through movement and, and other kinds of things. So that's kind of the overall idea of these different artifacts. And then a third artifact we also did is that uh, we wanted to uh, try to then celebrate some of the few women who actually have uh, done important things in computer science. And um, we then took up uh, Grace Hopper, which I'm sure all <laughs> you know who is. But one of the things she did besides many other things is that she found the first bug in a computer. And back then it was a real moth that flew into one of the tubes and she picked it out and you can see here on the picture next to her it's actually the actual box she found she actually put like tape in her notebook and this is the box she found so we wanted to tell that story in a different way changing um, uh, thinking about computer science we did this grace installation which is a three meter times two meter large installation with iot devices so there is um uh, eight mic controllers in this so this is an old computer that goes online. And then we asked participants in particular presented this last year at the ACM Multimedia Conference in 2019, uh, where about 400 people, we asked them to actually write down what are the bugs they experience in terms of having more women in computer science. They wrote all these bugs uh, or the bugs they have identified on origami paper and they folded them up as origami bugs. So we had created these kind of bugs and we add them, then they added that to the Grace installation and then they could actually interact and debug the system using one of our apps. So in this way, it was both a fun story, but it also kind of combined kind of in this case, paper and, and IoT devices in a, in a story to kind of collect data about what are the challenges here. To give you some of the things we found, uh, some of the challenges here, we, we then open up all the bugs and discuss it with people. And I'm just going to give you a, a one example here. So one wrote, uh, student can sometimes be very negative and abusive of my status as a young female professor. Nasty comments and reviews and evaluation hurts the most. Very inclusive community, sensitive to diversity issue uh, by senior colleagues approaching you and openly asking if things are okay or if there's something needed to help help with support. So we actually found a lot of things in a lot of these stories we collected and thought, okay, what, what do we need to do? Well, actually it's not, and what we found on basically here was, this is not just an outreach project where we try to get more people in. No, it's also a project where we need to look inside of computer science and see what can we actually change for the experience when you're actually inside. So basically what we needed was to figure out how do we foster structural and cultural trains from within through design activities, because <laughs> that's kind of the main idea with this project is we do a design activities as a way to do this. And then we also thought about, well, now we told the story about Grace Hopper, which is like this sole genius, nobody can question her, how important she was. But the thing is that it would also give you an idea that you have to be an, a genius to be successful. Like, and if you're not a genius and you don't feel it, maybe it's not for you. So we wanted to change that and not just about, talk about like one geniuses, but actually talk about groups of women who did important. We want to show that there's actually a mass of people here and you, it's not just you have to be alone. And then basically we want to kind of rewrite the history uh, through design activity as a way to change the future because it was very clear to us that there was a lot of those stories about the women that was not really there. So we started to look at, well, we had looked at this solidarity genius, Grace Hopper, but what other women are there? So there are the women uh, who helped um, uh, break the Enigma code during the Second World War. They have also been in, in, uh, in uh, different movies. There is the women uh, in NASA, who is also the women starring in Hidden Figures. It's also a group of women. And there's the women who actually did the first uh, programming of the first general computer. So there are these groups of women that have started to come up and you can actually find information about it. My challenge when I was looking at this, and I actually looked at a lot, these are really cool women. I thought we could make really cool design artifacts that demonstrate all kinds of things. But at the same time, it seems that all those stories was very black and white and about war. And I thought, well, can we do something more contemporary? Can we tell stories which has more color in and maybe have more kind of um, interest for people because we want to have people to start to talk about these things. Uh, so, so what can we do with that? And then uh, I'm sure you all have seen this 
uh, a graph. It's like a graph that's been quoted so many times, but this is basically the graph about the decline in women participation in computer science in the 80s. So uh, this is for US um, uh, data. So what you can see here is that women started to go more into university, medical school, law school, physical science, and then computer science is the red one that kind of breaks down around the 80s. And one of the things that happens around that time was uh, home computer gaming. So computer games started to enter the houses um, and, and gaming became very much about what did you do with computers. So based on that, I, uh, we decided, I didn't do it myself, I, will, <laughs> I was the head of it, but together with Daniela Rasna, we decided to uh, focus on the women who did computer games in the 70s and 80s. And we chose to focus on Atari because Atari was the first platform. Uh, I, it's more uh, known in the US than other places, but it has been all over the world. But it was actually the first kind of gaming platform that entered people's houses uh, and where people were playing with that. So these games back then actually have um, set a lot of kind of um, uh, emphasis on uh, how computer game has happened in the homes. Uh, so that's why we kind of started to say, okay, were there actually women who did um, games uh, for, for Atari games? And who were they? And there were women, and you can see this is some of the pictures of games they have actually created. So when I then started there, I thought, okay, I need to, to learn about uh, Atari. What is, the doc what is documented? Um, there's a lot of pop culture about it. What is there? So I started to look in books. You can also see here I have some of the books here behind me, kind of to see what is written about Atari. Uh, there's a lot about the art, what the business was, what uh, about the technology. There was, there's also different movies. There is a, a movie called Once Upon Atari, which is actually made by one of the game developers where they actually talk about the experience and so on. There's this other movie called Game Over, which is talking about how the worst game all ever had been, been made. The E.T. game um, was uh, dug down in, in the desert and how people went out to kind of do an excavation work like an archaeology and kind of finding those old games. There's a whole movie about that. Uh, and also, if you look at Atari, it also been starring a lot of these pop culture uh, images. So here you have a picture from Blade Runner and you can see in the background there is the Atari logo. Uh, also, this is the, uh, the series Hold and Cats Fire. Here you can also see an Atari game. This is the centipede game you can see in the background. It's, so it's also starring in different games. Um, and then there's also this, all this culture, pop culture about this. So for example, a few years ago, there was a new uh, movie that came out, Ready Player One, which is based on this book, where the whole movie and the whole book is basically about game trivia and how to know all these many small details about different games and who made what and so on. So there's like a huge big culture around this uh, that is actually extremely fascinating. Uh, so I started to kind of look into all that to kind of understand what, what is going on here? Uh, uh, what, what is this about? Uh, also, I think it's important to say that uh, it's not just old things. It's actually also very, uh, in, in these days, it's not just something that happened in the 80s. So of course, Ready Player One is one of the new uh, movies. Also, uh, Captain Marvel, uh, Centerpiece, actually also part in Cap Captain Marvel, which was only like in 2019 it came out. And there's also on the Comic-Con, which is also this big co uh, convention for pop culture and games and, and movies. And there's also like panels about um, um, uh, Atari. So, uh, so a lot of these stories kept on being repeated in different ways uh, to, to kind of state what is this and how important it is and people are really uh, enjoying this and it's, it's very fascinating, absolutely. Also, uh, besides uh, all these kind of pop culture references and books, there's also other types of Atari documentation. There are uh, different museums. The Strong Museum in, uh, in New York is particularly dedicated to documenting games and they also have parts about Atari. Uh, there is a Gamer Sutra there. This is also a, a platform where there's a lot about different um, uh, games and history. There's a lot of history uh, uh, there as well. Uh, and also on the Computer Historic Museum, you can also find things about Atari. So there's a lot of, of information in those places as well. And then there's all the fans website. There, which is also like a hole you dig yourself in and you can never get out when you first start to read all that. So these, uh, there's this Atari age where there's an extreme documentation of what are the games and which system did they use for and who made the games and so on. 
And then there's the Atari Museum, which is also uh, having all these different kind of references and so on. So very exciting, all these things. However, when I read through all this material, I'll just show you, there is so few women and they are hardly mentioned. And if they're mentioned, they may be made mentioned by a name. There is not, no stories about them. Just to give you an idea, when you read about a lot of the other developers, you hear much more about uh, what they also were and what they, but here, if you, you can, on Atari H, for example, you can find some names. You can find out that Suki Lee made um, a, a Mad Grand Prix, but it does not say anything else. Like who was Suki Lee, where is this and so on. However, by trying to connect some of these different things, I tried to identify uh, who are the Atari women uh, in all this uh, and what did they do and so on. And I managed to find 28 names. I actually found 15 and of course, uh, they are older uh, ladies today because it was some years ago that they actually made these things. Um, and they are not, a lot of these people are not on Facebook or LinkedIn and so on. So it actually took quite some digging to actually find people. But I managed to find 15 of them, which I'm really proud about. And I wrote uh, stories about 13. It was not everybody who wanted their story told. Um, it was also clear in this kind of process of trying to find like who, who were they was actually that Yes, there was the Atari company uh, where they were working, but actually they were also doing Atari games in other companies. And we have to kind of look at all these different companies to identify who were the women. So there may be, be two women there or two women there, but together they actually all did Atari games in that period. So uh, I kind of sat my to, myself to, um, when I wrote the story, some of them uh, are unfortunately dead. So it, I'm more based on, on uh, written sources, uh, but most of them I actually managed to interview. So I did interview with most of these people to kind of tell their stories. And now I'm gonna tell you some stories, which I hope you will you know, take with you and also tell other people. So, and I'm just gonna give you some of the stories and then you can, you can read more about them later. But the first story I wanna tell you is actually that about uh, Rebecca Heinemann, who was the world's first eSport champion. And it was actually yesterday, exactly 40 years ago. On November 10th, uh, 2020, it's 40 years ago that she actually won this and became the world first eSport champion. Not um, uh, the woman's champs in the set, no, the world's first one. So uh, she played Space Invaders in New York in the age of 17 uh, and won. Uh, and this was also the first eSport championship uh, and it was an Atari uh, championship. Besides that is of course extremely cool. But besides that, she is even more cool because she's also a game developer and she actually created approximate 275 games. And you, if you think of that, that's like a lot of games. And um, just in 2019, she's still creating games. She actually released three new uh, games on Steam. So she's extremely productive um, and keep on being very, very productive uh, and doing a lot of things. Um, when I asked her, when I interviewed her, like, what is she most proud of? She's most proud of Bart's Tale Free, which she, she made um, back in 87. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure, I don't think this was for a uh, particular platform. She did other games for other platforms as well. But what she was really proud of at that time was this thing that she actually added female characters back then. And if you're following uh, game discussions today, there's still discussion of, do we really need that? But actually already back in 87, she was actually a front runner doing that. So remember, if you go to Twitter, her uh, name is Burger Betty, and you should definitely say congratulations for 40 years ago and mention that, you know, she was really cool. So uh, if you're on Twitter, I would totally recommend to go uh, and say congratulations uh, for 40 years. That's, that's pretty amazing. Another amazing uh, woman is Sugi Lee. So first I should say, it was so difficult for me to find Sugi Lee. I can tell you Sugi Lee as a name is a very, very normal name. There is millions of people out there with this name. And uh, when I started to kind of look into it, I just found her name by a few games. You can see she made Open Leagues, Matt Grand Prix and Donald Duck Speedboat, but I, I couldn't find any other information. And I was actually about kind of giving up. And then when I did an interview with another of the Atari women, I always in the end of the interview say, do you know of other people I could interview? And do you have some contact? And she said, oh yeah, I know Sugi Lee. Um, we are having a lunch once a year still. I like, I got all excited. Can you ask her if I can contact her? And she was, when, when I contact, she's just the most amazing person. And she was very excited to talk to me. So that was like a, a really, 
very, very high, high stain for, uh, for me. So Sugi Lee is actually the first, uh, uh, first generation Chinese immigrant game developer, uh, so, which actually uh, started uh, to, uh, at all in, um, in game development. And uh, when I interviewed her, she began to talk to her, uh, she talk, told me this story about one of her colleagues, uh, uh, Jim Turner. So Jim Turner is a colleague that uh, she works. She works for Apple now. She still uh, is. Uh, she's still working, and um, and uh, Jim is a really hardcore uh, Atari fan, right? He selects games and so on. And he wrote this is a this is a Facebook um, uh, uh, what do you call it? post. He, I'm allowed to use this. I'm just going to read aloud what he posted. He said, "Bought a bunch of Atari games today, and while I was reading up of them, I found out that this one was written by my team's curing EPM. It's like I've been working next to royalty without even knowing it." And what you can see here, he actually had the game, he had it in front of him, and he got her to sign that game, and how cool that really was. Uh, when I talked to uh, Sugi Lee uh, about her experience and so on, uh, uh, and what does it mean uh, that she actually was one of those few, she said to me, someone recognizing my work after all these years. I never thought about it, but now being recognized as a pioneer, one of just a few women programmers at a time in the early days, simply blows my mind. So uh, she is a really uh, cool person and uh, yeah, she made these different games. So this is one of her games that she has here as well. Um, so then there is Laura Nicholas. She um, uh, worked for Parker Brothers, so a different company, but did also do Atari games. And she is actually the one who did the first ever Spider-Man game. And if you think about how many Spider-Man's got games that come since, she actually did the first one. So uh, when I interviewed her, uh, she explained to me that in 1980s, she was in a uh, a job fair when you went to walk around and talk for um, people working in technology and being computer programmers and so on like that. And then she was walking around. She was basically the only woman in this uh, woman in this uh, large um, uh, room. And then same, someone came to her. Are you lost? And she said, no, I'm interested and actually can do real time programming. So, yeah. And she ended up getting a job at uh, uh, Parker Brothers uh, where she did Spider-Man. Uh, and she was the first woman who were then hired at Paga Brothers, basically, at that time. Uh, and she wrote, to tell a little about uh, when she was writing Spider-Man, she said, Spider-Man is written on 4K RAM, which is nothing compared with today's standard. So you had to do a lot of tight programming, which is also why the games were so primitive back then compared with today. So, uh, so actually, I think it's important to say that back then, games were written by one person. I mean, today you cannot imagine a game being written by one person. But back then, it was actually the people they did all. They did the graphics, they did the music, they did everything. Uh, it, later, there was more people coming in, but in those first one, they did everything. Uh, so, so she she did this game, and uh, she also later became a mom, got kids, and her her um, her sons are very proud of what she did, and then she, they also tend to explain that to them when they meet friends, and then uh, they often get this response back, no way, did your mom really do that, your mom? So I think also this about, we need to recognize that these very cool women did these things. Now, the next story I want to tell you is about uh, Betty Ryan. Uh, she has her degree from, um, uh, from Howard University. And in 82, she was the ninth employee and first woman game developer at GCC, which is uh, on the East Coast of the US. Uh, so here you can actually see a picture of Betty herself standing in front of the quantum um, uh, uh, coin up um, uh, uh, system that she made. Uh, and what was really uh, uh, impressive with this is that uh, she actually, it is a vector game and she made it possible for the one who get the, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, first place to actually write your name on the win uh, using cursive letters or italic letters. Uh, so, so because you actually use this touch, uh, touch board and so on. So that's kind of one of the, the, the technology fancy parts. She also did other uh, system like, um, Pole position and dig dog, you can see here. She, so she was very, very, um, uh, she did so many different things, a lot of very technical work, but then she actually left the game industry when she came in industry, when she, her first child was born. Actually, the story is that uh, she was at work. So she worked until seven o'clock that night, went home and at 8.30, it was time to go to the hospital. And that was my, the end of my career. So she ended up having four kids. 
And a, a lot of the women I talked to who ended up getting kids actually ended up leaving the, the business. And their, um, their children only know them as uh, moms. Only, of course, it's important to be a mom, but they don't know about their technical background. And that also means that uh, they, they don't necessarily realize how uh, uh, kind of the, the home, uh, the help with schoolwork is actually done by really, really cool people who know a lot of things. And, and but they don't think it kind of link that to have an uh, industrial um, or like a, a degree or that you are very good out in industry. So I think there's also something about recognizing that the women who ended up uh, leaving the work uh, for, for family reasons, we also need to remember them when, when we talk about this. So then I'm going to talk a little about uh, Karla Menensky. So Karla Menensky is also, I mean, they're all very, very cool. She, uh, have, she's a math major and have a degree in psychology from Stanford University from uh, 77. She was also a Atari game developer for the, uh, in the, one of the first uh, hires uh, back then. Uh, and then she got tired of making games. These are three of the games she made, Dodge Em, Warlords and Star Raider. But then she got tired and then she went more in the business and she started to actually do some of the very early tool for high-end computer graphics. Uh, again, this is the one that I now are used to create, uh, you know, fancy uh, um, uh, things for movies and stuff like that. But she actually did some of the first one. Then she got tired of that and she went into hardware architecture and design instead. And then in 2004, she got tired of that and she then graduated from law school. So now she's actually working in Silicon Valley as a copyright lawyer, uh, attorney uh, at this stage. So I think what is important here is that she actually did a lot of many careers. Um, and then at the same time, uh, she kept on talking about, well, actually, when I was interviewing her, she had, she had this combined of being an artist. And then she said, I was a bit of an artist and some way along the way, I got the idea that computers could be used for animation and artists. And that was actually why she went into it. And think of the, at that time, you, you have not necessarily seen all the animation and so on. So it was actually very impressive that that was kind of the connection she did. So she was extremely, extremely cool. However, when Stanford chose to uh, make a particular, uh, in their alumni magazine, they made an article of game changers. So how st Stanford faculty, students, and alumni shaped the evolution um, uh, of, of games, she's not even mentioned. And she told me, because you get the, the magazine, because she, you know, she used to be at the university, and she was like, why am I not even mentioned there? So this is an example of, of some of those um, sources that doesn't even mention uh, particular women. Also, she had a Wikipedia website um, and there was wrong information. She's been trying to change it. It is changed now. Uh, but uh, when she was trying to kind of contact them and say, it's wrong, what is there? It was actually a wrong picture of her. It was a picture of some other Menensky, also from Stanford, but not her. Um, and, uh, but then she was told she did not have a formal reference so she could actually change it. Uh, so that was just kind of, uh, so, so I think this thing about trying to be recognized and actually getting into those sources and being part of the history is also about how they, have, they are not present at some of those sources that would have them you know, normally. And then I also going to tell you a little about Chris Maddock. So now we talked a lot about the programmers. And of course, programmers is very uh, important when you think about um, uh, games. But uh, there's also the people who do the actual manufacturing of the circuit boards and all that kind of thing. And there was actually a lot of women working in that, actually uh, working on this. So Chris Maddock was one of them. So basically she did electronic um, uh, mechanical manufacturing of Atari games. Uh, and one of the things she did is that she built the first automatic chip tester, which was a way for them to actually test automatically whether the chip worked rather than kind of sitting everybody and kind of see in the end. So that was one of the things she built. Um, and uh, when I asked her, was that difficult? And so she said, no, it was no problem for me to figure out how to do this, that chip tester. I could build anything. So basically, uh, she was very good at, at building and constructing things and so on. That was kind of something really important. Now, uh, when I talk about, I tell about this story, I should also say that I really tried to find more women or actually people in the manufacturing of that. And there's actually movies online about uh, Atari uh, being manufactured. So I found a lot of these pictures, but all these videos displaying these manufacturing of games, it's very clear. You can see there's factories as well, women working there, uh, but there's no names. There's also women of color uh, working there, but there's no names. So it actually is, 
uh, impossible. So I've been trying. And if anyone who hear this presentation know of some of these women, please let me know. I would love to talk to them and include them as well. But it's actually important also to say, well, we cannot just focus on the people with the high uh, educations, uh, the programmers who come from university. We also need to consider all the people who did important contribution of making uh, the game industry, which to get day is like one of the biggest industry uh, in software um, engineering and so on. So that's, I think that's important to think about as well. Uh, then there is uh, Patricia Goodmanson. So music is a huge part of the gaming experience. And it's actually, uh, when you listen to that music back then, you might think, hmm, isn't that just like a simple music, but actually to do it really well, uh, it requires skills. So Patricia Goodmanson was actually one of the people who did music uh, specifically for, uh, for games. And uh, she said, uh, you know, when I was interviewing, she saying, well, during my interview, the future boss said right away, he said, if you can play Beethoven Opus 109 Sonata, what are you doing here? I mean, she was a classical uh, educated uh, musician, right? Well, he's still my good friend to this day. And he was the first person in the business world that seems to get me at all. So uh, what is important um, uh, about uh, this music is to say, well, uh, she was actually sitting and trying to find music that could kind of work in loops uh, and kind of still be played in different ways and, and that is still kind of work in long and short and that could still be programmed on very little RAM, right? <laughs> so it's also about what can you actually do? And I think it's important that we also recognize this. So she did music to, to uh, some of these games. So Pac-Man Jr., Desert Falcon and, and uh, Food Fight. So this is some of the music. Uh, so when you're playing this game, you're actually listening to Patricia Goodmanson's music. Uh, and then there is uh, Carol uh, Ryan. Uh, so what is interesting with her is, uh, and you all know, as software developers, right? A huge, most of the work is not just about programming. It's also about debugging and testing. And uh, Carol Ryan, she actually did debugging and testing on games. Uh, and I think, again, it's important we also recognize those people who do that kind of work. It's not just uh, the, the front end programmers. Um, and she said, I think most kids today would love a job where they get paid to sit and play video games for 40 hours a week. That's what I did. Um, and later she did almost a, a lot of other things. And she particularly explained to me that one of the, co uh, the core things to be successful at this is to be uh, pay attention to details, be very thorough, be very systematic and all that. So even though you think, oh, games is all fun and games, no, actually the work that really makes it uh, work really well, really require a lot of systematic work. So these are some of the stories uh, that I collected. So now we have all these stories. And just and these two pictures I'm just going to show you here is actually one picture from GCC. And in this picture, there's actually several Atari women. And the other picture is from um, uh, 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 at the Atari uh, Corporation. And here in this picture, you can see uh, Kala Meninsky sitting in the front and Sugi Lee standing next to her. And that's actually the day that Steven Spielberg was visiting them. He's standing next to Sugi Lee on the picture. Uh, to talk about creating this ET game, which later be known as the worst game on earth, right? So all these stories, all these documentation is actually not really part of all these stories. So what do we then do with all these stories? Well, the next question then for us, when we when after I collected all these stories was how to challenge the unbalanced gender representation in retro gaming through what we call intertextual design. Because one thing is I now found all those stories, but basically I want them in all these pop culture. I want them in and all these documentation, all these books, so people remember them when they tell the stories and they just become normalized into his story, this history. So that was the, that was the next kind of challenge. And then it's important to say, what is gaming currency? Like what, how, what makes people have voice and visibility in gaming? And because I've read all this about the materials and, and interacting with people in terms of gaming, it's very clear that that's kind of two main things that is really giving currency. One is referencing trivia, knowing about trivia and referencing and finding links and how story connects. That's a huge thing to do that. So uh, basically, I, uh, so that was a strategy. We want to have these references and this trivia connected. The other major things uh, I found was all these retro artifacts, all these collectibles that you can uh, show and you, you collect them and you have them. So basically these were the two ways we thought about our design 
you know, challenges? How do we kind of get those stories out to people? So first we thought, well, we're gonna try to impact the pop culture uh, because clearly that's where this thing is happening. And it has been, uh, Atari has been celebrated at uh, Comic-Con before. So we decided, can we uh, get our work into Emerald City Comic-Con in 2019? So uh, we were happy, we were successful in that. So we had a panel where we also had um, uh, Rebecca Heinemann, who is the eSport champion you saw earlier. We also had originally Donna Bailey, she's another woman I can tell you a little about uh, a little later, uh, but, uh, but unfortunately she couldn't fly at that time, so she couldn't join us. But then we also had other uh, prominent women within the computer gaming industry uh, presence, so Kate Edwards, uh, Catherine Cross, and Evie Powell. So we had this panel where we introduced the things and, and so on. Uh, and because we were at Comic-Con, we want to talk the language of Comic-Con, and that is cosplay. So people dressing up like their favorite characters and demonstrating their, their things. So we created the Thai woman heroine outfit. You can see here uh, from the actual uh, Comic-Con, there's pictures here. Uh, and you can also see because now I'm in my office and here is actually the, the thing is here, right? Like back uh, behind me, <laughs> you can actually see the, the, the costume. So it lights up and, on, uh, and it demonstrates these boxes on it. It's actually, there is eight of them. So it's uh, this kind of eight bit computer chip uh, for Atari, it, it demonstrates. It has the Atari logo uh, and then it blinks in different patterns in terms of like rainbows to also show about this kind of diversity. And then we actually have um, different, um, maybe you can see it here, but also on the picture on the, on the right, uh, we have made uh, logos for all the women's we made stories about, and those logos are then actually posted on, on the, 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 the outfit. And in this way, by actually walking around with this outfit, we actually interacted with, with different people and, and they got interested and we told them the story. So trying to kind of talk this kind of the language of Comic-Con. Uh, we managed to um, uh, get some attention, so we were on the Sci-Fi channel doing the Comic-Con. Uh, we were also mentioned in GeekWire, which is like a Seattle-based tech uh, uh, magazine, uh, and also on K5, which is a local TV station. And then uh, actually our outfit was also part of a fashion show <laughs> in Pioneer Square in Seattle, uh, invited after this. So I think it actually did gave us some, some interaction with different people and allowed us to kind of reach out to more about these stories. Um, then uh, another thing this about, uh, a lot of these games are like art pieces. It's like old art pieces. Uh, so we also want to kind of try to kind of build on that art piece idea so basically I started to collect, uh, maybe you also can see some behind me, I have like different parts here. So I started to collect uh, on, um, on Craigslist, uh, Atari games, the original characters of games. And I sent them to the women or I went to them depending on if I were to meet them soon or whatever. And I got them to sign them. So I have signed um, uh, games like, uh, just like you, you saw that Suki Lee had signed uh, the other game from her, her colleagues. So basically we took that idea of an, a, an already fan that likes to do this. We then used, reused that thing to actually collect these uh, game cards, get them signed. Uh, and then we 3D printed these um, uh, frames because we wanted to have it just like in a museum. So, uh, and all these uh, frames are also downloadable uh, 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 on our website, you can actually go in and download these different kind of frames and actually print them yourself for your own Atari game if, if you want to do that. So also allow other people to do that. So, uh, so now we have this collection, or I have this collection in my office, which also includes this mini uh, center bee made of Donna Bailey. And here you can see Sugi Lee uh, when she was uh, with her signed uh, piece. Now, having all these collections of, of these kind of games, one thing is that we can take them, of course, to Comic Con and show that. But another thing is that we actually put it on the museum. So uh, it, we had an exhibition. We were uh, both in the Living Computer Museum, but then also in Seattle Retro Gaming uh, Exhibition, where we showed these games, and people uh, uh, were all excited about them. And, and this is a way to talk about it and then tell the stories. And this, that you can actually see physically what they actually made. So, so that was another thing we did. So again, this is the collectible and also having these kind of trivia stories in that. And then to really have these stories to kind of link, uh, link together and referencing, we did um, a remix of the old Pac-Man game. 
Now I'm sure you all know Pac-Man, like little yellow cheese that eats small dots. But we basically did another Pac-Man game, just like Pac-Man, but instead of being a little yellow cheese, you are a, um, a women, a game developer who is eating zeros and ones. And instead of fighting ghosts, you are fighting bugs in the system. And then you can see that the bugs are actually based on the Grace bug from the, uh, the earlier installation about Grace Hopper. Uh, so, uh, so that is a kind of connection to other things as well. Then uh, Donna Bailey, I haven't talked to her about that, but I'm going to say a little about her. So Donna Bailey uh, was the first uh, woman to work in the coin-op division at Atari, and she made the Sensipi game. And uh, the Sensipi game is actually one of the best uh, financial success ever. That's also why they actually made a small one, because there's actually money in this. <laughs> I have it signed, so mine is even more cool than others. Um, and uh, and this is also, this particular Centipede game is also very recognized, it's in like in Captain Marvel in the Hold and Catch Fire, it's like a re really huge success. Now the thing is that Donna Bailey had over the years actually thought for that having her name in, in that history, because a lot of the older uh, citation only talk about her, the program manager, the male program manager, who was the program manager of the project where this was created. She was the programmer. She was the designer of the game, but she was not mentioned. So uh, when I had been interviewing, with, uh, talked to her many, many times, and she actually had written a manuscript, a film manuscript about her experience working at Atari back in the 70s. Now it's not published and she's not sure she wanna publish that, but I have read it. She, uh, and then we together selected quotes uh, that, that we could use. And those quotes are now in this game that we have our remix Pac-Man game. So each time you reach a level, it's like the cutscenes between, you can actually hear Donna Bailey, a quote from her play on that. So this is kind of bringing voice to her. You hear her voice reading up her own quotes from this uh, thing. So, so that's also in, in the game. And very soon you can actually listen to one of them. And then the music we put in the game is then Patricia Goodman's on music and we uh, were allowed to use the music from Pac-Man Jr., which is the one she created. So in this way, the game in itself actually embeds a lot of those references to different things. Further, you can play it, by the way, on our website. <laughs> I can show you the website later. Um, but uh, be uh, besides having on the website, we also we um, uh, hacked an old Atari box. You can see here, I have it also over here in my, my cupboard, where you can actually play this game like uh, just like if it was kind of like a Wii. Uh, so you kind of move, you can be four people and play it with your hands while just sitting and doing uh, the, the arrows on the keyboard. So, these are, so this, uh, this uh, game is a place where we both kind of bring in kind of these trivia stories and intellect into something that people already know very well. And now I am gonna try to, so you can hear, um, uh, Donna uh, Bailey, how she, this is a quote from the game where she talks about what it meant to start at Atari. On my first day at work in coin -op at Atari, I was introduced to maybe 30 people, 30 guys in less than one hour. My summary, my comment after meeting those guys so quickly was, I won't remember any names. How many Daves are there? Are they all mostly Dave? What's the deal? That's crazy. I'll just call everyone Dave. So I think what is interesting with this particular quote is that uh, I actually often heard, how come there'd be more Dave in the room when you are in, uh, in a tech company than actually women? So there is something about this Dave apparently. So, so, so this is an example of some of the cutscenes, and you can hear more uh, in the game. And if you can't really win the game, I myself cannot win the game. You can also do a cheat and just go and watch the cutscenes if you wanna do that, because I would never get to see the cutscenes because I'm not that good at pac -Man. So, okay, so, so we made all these things, um, but then it's also about what impact did we have? Because we wanted basically to have impact from our events to interact with people. And I've just brought some of these uh, quotes from some of this impact. So this is an imp uh, a quote from uh, Comic-Con. So one of the participants said, one that, that was there on a panel, she said, or her, I don't know, man, man I think, it's a man who said this. Uh, I work in IT. I wish we had more women involved along with more non-white people in general. The additional perspective, a greater mix of backgrounds uh, bring can be very valuable. I feel like it's getting better, but I have witnessed women being treated differently in tech than men. The latent misogyny present in my industry is disturbing to see, and I have the privilege of insulation of being white, male, and cis. So here, this is uh, one 
quote. Another quote, this is from the Living Computer Museum. One of the participants said, I didn't realize there were so few women in programming, but I was surprised to learn that women were at the front, uh, forefront in developing games. I thought women only recently became involved. And that's something we, we often heard. Oh my God, were they actually back then? We had never expected that. Uh, another quote also from Living Computers is, that they are so low key and not recognized because a lot of these women, they are very low key. Uh, and, and I don't think they ever thought about being recognized and making artifacts about them if I have not contacted them, right? Um, and here is a, a quote from Seattle Retro Game. Some said, I love Atari's history and I've read a lot of books on it, but never do they mention the importance of women. And this is also my own experience when I read all these books that, that women are basically not mentioned. Uh, and when I ask people what surprised you the most, they all say, I will just call them all Dave. Basically, everybody mentioned that, um, that quote from, from Donna Bailey as something that surprised them the most. Now, we also want to have uh, impact online. So not just in the events, because if we really want to spread it, we need to have like an online presence uh, and so on. So we made the Atai Women um, uh, website, which you can also go in afterwards, where you can see the different stories. You can also play the game, uh, the Pac-Man. It's just called ataiwomen.org uh, and read about the different events and so on. Uh, so we have that uh, present. But then we also have an Instagram account where we kind of posted uh, different uh, I, I, When I took this picture of the Instagram, we had 100 followers. I think maybe we had 120 now. It's not too many, but you know, I think it's still some uh, that actually follow what, what we do there. And then the big thing is to how do we get into those fan websites, those Facebook pages where they are really celebrating the entire women. So, they can be very hard if you know bring something that is interesting to them. So uh, we actually took a long time about, and before we had created the whole website with all the details and so on. And before we even, I, I really felt the day I was kind of linking it there on on, on the, the this is the um, Atari Museum. Like, what will they say? Will they hate it or what? I mean, <laughs> I really hope they like it. Um, and I was very happy to see that. Uh, so when I did this screenshot, it, it's some time ago. Um, some said, you know, very cool, awesome very interesting thing for sharing. So I'm very, very these are maybe it seems very little, but for me that that's really important because I want to talk back to the fans who are the fans because they are the carrier of these histories. They are the one we need to tell those stories. And then I got very excited. So we also did these Atari uh, tokens. So basically it's laser cut uh, small tokens with um, uh, the women's logos and Atari games, and, which is like a collectible we give to people. And then uh, on Twitter, I got this message from a fan uh, having a, li a link called Atari Spot. He writes, hello, Panila, question for you. Is there a way to get the set of the Atari Women game tokens? I think there will be a nice and interesting addition to my collection. Let me know if they are being sold anywhere, please. I got, of course, extremely excited and I just sent him stuff because I just want them out. I mean, they're not sold anywhere. But, but this idea that there's actually a fan that see what we created here as something that is valuable, something you want to have collectible, that's also what we try to kind of get in. So, so I'm very proud about that one as well. And then another thing is that actually there is some fans who start to remix some of the things we did. Uh, so uh, we didn't, I, we were reach out. So Martine here, she, she reached out to us she is doing her thesis. I had, I, uh, she's in the Netherlands. I didn't know her in any way on cyborg mermaids. But then she also turns out she's the processional musician and a retro gamer. So she actually um, um, uh, played in the, the classical music uh, made by Patricia Goodmanson and make a link together. So I hope I can play a little about that here. So let's see if it will work. Uh, so I just have to see if one moment. So then I do shop sharing and then I do start sharing here. And now I hope you can see my YouTube screen. And let's see if it works.
So I hope you got some idea about this. So I, the, the point here is that, uh, that she actually took pictures and music that we have and then remixed it um, into something new that she shared with us and which we then uh, also put on, on the Italian Women website. So in this way, actually having fans, uh, you know, remixing our stuff uh, into something, uh, I'm really proud of that. I think that's also a, a good way to demonstrate impact online. Um, yeah. So, but then you also know if you really want to change history, history is made on Wikipedia. So if it's not on Wikipedia, it doesn't exist, right? That's where people go. So that's why uh, we also started to kind of do Wikipedia editing. And uh, we, when we started to do that, it turns out it was really difficult. And basically everything I did was just deleted in like no time. It was very, <laughs> you didn't feel very productive. You did all this work and it was just gone in five minutes. So we then started to work with a group of women called um, uh, Women in Red on Wikipedia, who's particular dedicated into making all the red links on Wikipedia, which is basically where there's no information, into blue links. So Women in Red is making the links uh, blue. And together with, um, with them uh, and Rosie, who's kind of uh, created this, we started to editing this, uh, editing Wikipedia and get the entire women in. And actually yesterday uh, we had a Wikipedia editor and now uh, Betty Ryan Tilku actually got a Wikipedia page. So please join us in the effort. We're still doing it. It takes more time. But one of the major thing is now we actually have a place to reference to actually make these things. So we can actually change these things. So please, join us and we continue to do this. This is from yesterday. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. So intertextual design as this approach that I have been working on here uh, in this project is actually about creating relationship and connection to people in the present, like right now, who are carrier of the history of the past with the aim of changing the future. So in, in, in our case for gaming, it is the, the fans, the people who really re keep on telling the story. How can we make something that makes it relevant for them to actually tell those stories and in this way change the history. So it's about making design intervention that speaks the language of historical referencing, allowing design intervention to be taken up by people in the present when they are reminiscing, when they are thinking back on, on all these things that happened before. And it's about looking backward to connect history of computing to current and future cultures of computing. Uh, so for Atari women, the basic kind of language we've been using is this retro gaming language as a way to include contribution of women in the early days of gaming history to the current carriages of computer science history in pop culture as a way to change. So that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. And uh, in the word of um, uh, Catherine Cross, she says, the presence of women, queer people and people of color in gaming is novel. The discussion shouldn't be about lessening us in. Instead, it should be driven by the recognition that we have always been here and always will be. And I think that's really important to think about in terms of this project. It is not about that we need to outreach to get new people in. No, we need to kind of consider who is actually there and remember to celebrate what they did. And that's not just for gaming, it's for all kinds of parts of software engineering and computer science and so on. So, all the different artifacts I made, I did not make them by myself. So all these people have been involved and helped uh, in making the Atari Women Project. So you can just kind of see that. So then in the end, I will here out in the right side, you can see the name of the Atari Women uh, and the names of all the people you saw in the pictures before. And then uh, I will just say, remember to say congratulations to Burger Betty on Twitter that yesterday she was <laughs> the new eSports champion. And then we have an uh, upcoming paper in the Human Computer Interaction Journal uh, about uh, the Atari women. So I want to mention that. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Penny. So, um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll try to get as many questions as possible. Um, I let, let me start off with like one uh, with with a comment and a question. Like first is like very impressive work, and it's like like it's so amazing like how you how you did all these different outreach activities to really uh, promote the the history of the Atari women and all the different types of of fun. So that's that's really amazing. And 
yeah, I, I, I really like that a lot. So, so the question I have for you is, so thinking back about, uh, about the interviews and the stories that you heard, like what are lessons that we could take for, for today's software development or today's game development so that we, women who are working on games, that they are being remembered and that they get the correct credit? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So uh, I should say that when I did the interviews, I, most of the women I've been interviewed for at least an hour, often it's been maybe two hours. And sometimes we actually did it over several times and it was like three or six hours in some cases to really get mm -hmm. all the stories. And I think one of the things that, that I really learned, so of course now what we have done so far, it is only celebrating what they did. We don't talk about mm -hmm. all the problems that I also was told about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's not part of the Atari Women Project as it is right mm -hmm. now. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out how, how to kind of deal with that other part of all that material I have. Um, so, so we've been focusing on first, let's just recognize that they actually did, were there and they did this. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the next step, so when I transcribe, all the interviews have been transcribed in, in all details and there's a lot of material there. The challenge is that a lot of those stories uh, are also, that is more like problematic stories. Um, I, I also uh, done by people where they are actually their friends today. Mm -hmm. And because it's like, it's personal story, it's impossible to kind of um, make them anonymized. So mm -hmm. the big challenge here is that, uh, so the next step for us is actually to try to figure out how do we find a way to systemize the themes and what we can do and still exemplifies what is the issue in terms of the data without uh, jeopardizing any existing friendship with people or anything like that, which is the last thing I want. I'm still in contact with all the women. I <laughs> email them often about different things. They, we also sent pa the paper that is now coming out. Uh, I'm very happy about this. I send them to them uh, each version, you know how papers have a different version to get people's feedback and so on, to make sure that we, uh, never kind of overstepping any boundaries that they, they, they didn't want, because this is kind of, we can't anonymize them. They're not anonymized. They are, this is the person who said this. So, so I think that's the challenge and I haven't figured that out yet, but it's uh, a really, it's something I want to do. I just have to find a, the best way to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So we have one question from the, uh, from the chat. So, which is, from Alexander Seri um, how can we help and like, for example, add articles on Wikipedia or like, yes. yeah. I mean, that would be amazing. I mean, I think that, um, uh, so I think uh, there's several things to, to be done. So uh, the, in terms of the Wikipedia, we started up uh, kind of trying to add these different things into Wikipedia and it's, been taking a long time. Uh, I mean, it's over a year ago we started it and actually having enough people to kind of add that. So al always that's really important. If there's anyone want to join, I would love to kind of give them what are the list of the names and where are the materials and so on, because we collected all that. Uh, but I think even more if anyone is already Wikipedia editors, because it's also about um, how long is your credit in Wikipedia to get things in, to have them help to approve our uh, the things we are doing uh, and if other things are doing uh, is also really important. And also, uh, even though there is not that many women, actually, uh, it could also be that if you know any um, uh, other women that actually have done some important things, maybe think about adding them as well. And also try to maybe make article on Wikipedia in different languages. Because uh, just, uh, and, uh, just to give you an example of some of the challenges in this. So there's a category on Wikipedia called uh, software developers. And in that category, there's not many women. Then there's also another category called, uh, I think it's uh, uh, transgender software developers. Now, if you are in the transgender software, you're not in the software developer at the same time. That means that you are not, if you're just searching software developer, you don't see that kind of people. So it's also about working, like how can you make sure to, um, uh, to um, uh, have different categories attached to all these different people to make sure that they come up in different searches. Uh, if we can have um, uh, pages on, uh, so yesterday, another thing, so uh, uh, Rebecca Heinemann already had a Wikipedia page, but yesterday we made sure she had one now in Italian as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. So, so in this way, you get more present uh, uh, and, and, and sharing the stories more. 
So I think that could be, and, and, and generally just, you know, remember to tell the story and, and tell it to people. Uh, that's kind mm -hmm. of our main thing. Cool. So we're going to take two more questions. Um, okay. So the next question is by Andrea Veskan. And the question is, could you please provide more details about intertextual design and how it can be used in other subdomains in computer science? Yes, so intertextual design, I mean, it's coming out in this new paper. This is our kind of theoretical contribution of, of this mm -hmm. page, uh, this work. Uh, but basically it's, bas so intertextual work is basically about referencing. How do you reference and make connection to different things? And as a design approach, it's, it's meant in, uh, for, for domains where you wanna try to change something where uh, about how people talk about it or how people uh, use it by actually referencing and, and trying to kind of link into references that is not already there. So if you think about, uh, so right now we particularly have been using it uh, in terms of this gaming, but it could be in another domain. I have not actually done that yet. So it's a really good question, other subdomains. Uh, but I would say that it's subdomains where you wanna make a change and where there is something that is currently missing uh, from the reference pool that we're using. So another example could be, um, uh, so I'm just kind of making this up as we go, but if you think of citations in computer science research, there has been this uh, starting process to identify why women get less citation than men, for example. That's another re where references matters, how, you, how do you want to link that? So maybe that could approach us to actually look at intertextual design for that. Or if you look into the uh, uh, open source development uh, on GitHub. Also, uh, they, there has been some studies about uh, uh, women getting less of their um, uh, get more uh, less of their um, uh, uploads uh, uh, accepted. Uh, but if they don't say who they are, <laughs> they get more. Um, so, so that's another example again where the links and citation in that process maybe intertextual design could also do. So it's basically for subdomains where the references matters for the thing you want to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final question is by Basha Nusebi. It's a very engaging talk on important work. Thank you. I was wondering to what extent this uh, kind of research translates to other cultures, for example, like developing countries mm -hmm. and also our computing areas that are less glamorous than gaming. Yes, I, I really think, thank you so much for that question. So uh, in the beginning, I said, I have done a lot of work um, on tech entrepreneurship in Palestine and they, we have there some similar challenges. So when, so basically in that project, we have been going back to the West Bank and identified the, the companies and the tech developers working there and try to understand what are the challenges they have. Uh, and a lot of their challenges is actually about being noticed outside of Palestine as someone who can actually contribute and do things. And there's several reasons for that, why that is difficult. Uh, but just an example is that um, uh, having access to global platforms as distribution platforms. So, for, uh, so if you are an app developer, you will, and let's say, so if I'm in Denmark and I'm an app developer, I can actually release uh, my apps on, uh, you know, iStore and sell it to the old world. But if I am, um, uh, and everybody can pay in whatever salary, and then they can, I can actually earn money from that. But if you are in Palestine, because if, if you are developing a, uh, a, 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 an app for the Palestinian community, the people in the West Bank cannot, can download your app, but they can't pay for it because to pay for an app, you need to be physically located in the place uh, where you are having your bank account and where you actually are. Mm -hmm. And now the thing is that Palestine doesn't exist on the drop down menu up in the app store. That means that they have to be in Israel and they are not in Israel, they're the other side of the wall, they can't just move. Which basically is, is a problem in terms of referencing not being present. So let's say that that would, as an example, it could be in, in another developing countries and so on. Thinking about how do we then make their story visible to people and, and demonstrating through different artifacts, what are the challenges here? This could just be an example. Mm -hmm. and, and try to kind of impact the people who decide the drop down menu of App Store as an example. Mm -hmm. So, but very good question. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you so much um, 
for your fantastic keynote. Yeah. And so um, we are now going to continue discussion in, in Discord. So I hope maybe you can join us for some time in Discord. Yes, yes I will. And I'm sure people have lots of additional questions for you. Yes, yes, I will. Thank you so much for having me. I really yeah. enjoyed coming here. Thank you so much. Thank you.